Hi and welcome back to the History of Russia podcast. I'm your host Gareth. This is episode two, the East Slavs part two of what will be a three-part episode looking at the Slavs. Okay, so in the last episode we looked at who the Slavs were, where they possibly originated from, and also had a brief look at the linguistics as this possibly ties back into locating their homeland. I stress the word possibly, but for me I really like the Pripyat Marshes theory. There's something almost poetic in being able to tie down the homeland of a culture for the lack of words to describe trees found in areas they would later migrate to. In this episode, I'm going to spend some time looking at sources that describe early historical interactions, their appearance, and what led to their migration over such a large area of Europe. And then in the final part of the series, we can actually begin to look at the historical timeline and try to make sense of this chaotic period of history. Now let's take a look at what we can of Slavic society. Marija Gimbutas wrote, neither the Bulgars nor Avars, these were peoples that were from the Russian steppes, were able to colonise the Balkan Peninsula. After storming Thrace, Illyria and Greece, they went back to the territory north of the Danube. Now to quote, it was the Slavs who did the colonising. Entire families or even whole tribes infiltrated lands. And as an agricultural people, they constantly sought an outlet for their population surplus. Suppressed for over a millennium by foreign rule of Scythians, Sarmatians and Goths, they had been restricted to a small territory, but now the barriers were down and they poured out, end quote. In addition to the growth, the depopulation of Eastern Europe, due in part to Germanic migrations that were happening elsewhere in Europe and North Africa at the time, and the lack of imperial defences, really encouraged Slavic expansion. With an improvement in both technology and archaeological methods, during the 1960s, scholars began to believe that there was no need to explain cultural change exclusively in terms of migration and population replacement. According to historical linguist Joanna Nichols, ethnic spreads can involve either the spread of language to speakers of other languages or the spread of a population. Massive population spread or demographic replacement has probably been a rarity in human history. There is no reason to assume that the Slavic expansion was primarily a demographic event. Some migration took place, but the Prismus assumption is the Slavic expansion was primarily a linguistic spread. So essentially what she's saying is that it's not necessarily that these people were being, that originally inhabited the Balkans and Southern Europe were replaced by Slavs, but the Slavs incorporated these people and they became a large group of people that shared a common language as a result. Colin Renfrew proposed elite dominance and system collapse theories to explain language replacement. Now remember this theory for later as it will form an important part of the formation of the early Russian states. Essentially what this is getting at is the Slavs may have ruled as an, as an elite class and didn't necessarily make up the majority of the population. The Lukanov suggested their experience with nomads enabled the Slavs' political and military experience, becoming a dominant force and establishing a new socio-political network in the entire area of Central and Southeastern Europe. It seems that many setbacks, invasions and occupations the Slavs encountered in their early history is what prepared them to become such a force themselves. In effect, they've learned from experience. According to Paul Balford, and I quote, the Spartan Eleutherian Slavic culture clearly had something attractive for great numbers of the population living over considerable areas of Central Europe, end quote, resulting in their assimilation. To quote again, the anal analysis of Slav material culture, especially South Slavs, and results of anthropological investigations, as well as the loanwoods in philological studies, clearly demonstrate the contribution of the previous populations of these territories in the makeup of some of the Slav populations, end quote. Byzantine chroniclers noted Roman prisoners captured by the Slavs could soon become free members of Slavic society if they so wished. Horace Lunt attributed Slavic spread to, and I quote, the success and mobility of the Slavic special border units of the Avar Khanate. According to Lunt, only as a lingua franca could Slavic supplant other languages and dialects whilst remaining relatively uniform. Although it explains the formation of regional Slavic groups in the Balkans, Eastern Alps and the Morave Danube Basin, Lunt's theory does not account for the Slavic spread to the Baltic region and the territories of the Eastern Slavs. A concept related to elite dominance is system collapse. 
Now this is where there's a power vacuum that's created by the fall of the Hun and the Roman empires, and it allows a minority group to impose their customs and language over the majority population. So the two main barriers preventing prior expansion, firstly a dominant steppe tribe and a strong border on the Roman Danube frontier is now missing. And this is what leads to the Slavs leaving Ukraine and Belarus, pushing, pushing southwards and finding no resistance. Paul Barford suggests that Slavic groups might have existed in a wide area of central eastern Europe in the Chernikov and Zabrutsky Grosvky culture zones before the documented Slavic migrations from the 6th to the 9th centuries. Serving as auxiliaries in the Sarmatian, Goth and Hun armies, small numbers of Slavic speakers might have reached the Balkans before the 6th century. These scattered groups were centres for the creation of a Slavic cultural identity under favourable conditions. Assimilating or conveying their culture and language, this could then have paved the way for mass migration afterwards, for example after the end of conflict or during the non-campaigning winter months. A similar idea has been produced Proposed by Florin Kurta, seeing no clear evidence for migration from Polesia or elsewhere north, Kurta suggests that southeastern Europe saw the development of a broad area of economic and cultural t- traditions, where the living with the same regional widely scattered, adherence to this style helped integrate isolated ingredients within a group whose social boundaries crisscrossed those of local communities. During the early 600s, however, at the time of general collapse of the Byzantine administration in the Balkans, access and to manipulation of such artefacts may have been strategies for creating a new sense of identity for local elites. Cursor suggests that the chief impetus for this identity originated in the Danubian frontier. According to Patrick Geary, Slavic expansion was a decentralised but forceful process which assimilated a large population with small groups of what he calls soldier farmers, who had common traditions and language, to quote, without kings or large-scale chieftains to bribe or defeat, the Byzantine Empire had a little hope of either destroying them or corpsing them into their imperial system. Walter Pohl agrees. He goes on to state, Avars and Bulgars conformed to the rules of the game established by the Romans. They built up a concentration of military power that was paid in the last resort, from Roman tax revenues. Therefore, they paradoxically depended on the functioning of the Byzantine state. The Slavs managed to keep up their agriculture, and a rather efficient kind of agriculture by the standards of the time, even in times when they took their part in the plundering of the Roman provinces. The booty they won apparently did not, at least initially, create a new military class with the greed for more and a contempt for the peasants' work as it did with the Germans. Thus, the Slavic model proved an attractive alternative, which proved practically indestructible. Slav traditions, language and culture shaped, or at least influenced, innumerable local and regional communities, a surprise and similarity that developed without any central institution to promote it. These regional ethnogenesis, inspired by Slavic tradition, incorporated considerable remnants of Roman or Germanic population, ready enough to give up ethnic identities that had lost their cohesion. In terms of the appearance of the Slavs, as you'd expect, and as you're probably no doubt surprised, there is a scarcity of sources. However, I cite Precipius, the Slavs are tall and especially strong. Their skin is not very white, and their hair is neither blonde nor black, but all have reddish hair. They are neither dishonourable nor spiteful, but simple in their ways, just like the Huns. Some of them do not have either a tunic nor a cloak, but only wear a kind of breeches that is pulled up to the groin, end quote. Now it's interesting to note that modern Slavic people are amongst the least red-haired in Europe, with a usual frequency of just less than a percent. This goes directly against what we're told in this quote, but it was pretty much the only description I could find and is interesting nonetheless. Anthropological investigation of prehistoric Slavic sites appears to support views suggesting that the early Slavs were fair-haired. According to Luigi Luca Cavalli Sforza, anthropological observations are likely to reflect socio-economic, nutritional or environmental factors as genetic differences. From what we know of early Slavic culture, we know it was a typical decentralised tribal society of Iron Age Europe, organised into local chiefdoms. A slow consolidation occurred between the 7th and 9th centuries. During this period, the previously uniform Slavic cultural area evolved into discrete zones. 
Slavic groups were influenced by neighbouring cultures like the Greeks, the Khazars, Vikings and Carolingians influenced then their neighbours in return. Differences in status gradually developed in the chiefdoms, leading to the development of centralised socio-political organisations. The first centralised organisations may have been temporary pan-tribal warrior associations. The greatest evidence for this is in the Nubian area, where barbarian, barbarian groups organised around military chiefs to raid Byzantine territory and defend themselves against the Pannonian Avars. Social stratification gradually develops in the form of a fortified hereditary chiefdoms, first seen in the West Slav areas around Bohemia and Moravia. The chief was supported by a retinue of warriors who owed their position to him. As chiefdoms become powerful and expanded, centres of subsidiary power ruled by lesser chiefs were created. The line between powerful chiefdoms and centralised med- medieval states is blurred. By the, ni- sorry, by the mid-9th century, the Slavic elite was sophisticated. They wore luxur- luxurious clothing, rode horses, hunted with falcons, and travelled with their retinue of soldiers. In terms of early Slavic settlements, we know they were no larger than around five acres, typically between one to three acres in area. Settlements were often temporary, perhaps this reflects their intingent form of agriculture, and they were often along rivers. They were characterised by sunken buildings, known as Grubenhausen in German, or Polsimilianki in Russian. They were built over a rectangular pit that varied from 4 to about 20 metres squared. Um, if you're working in feet, that's about 40 to 220 square feet in area and could accommodate a typical nuclear family. Each house had a stone or clay oven in the corner, a defining feature of Eastern European dwellings, and a settlement had a population of between 50 to 70 people. Settlements tended to have a central open area where communal activities and ceremonies were conducted and they were divided into production and settlement zones. During the 9th century, stronger holds started to appear, especially, during the, especially in the area of the Western Slavic territories and were often found in the centre of a group of settlements. The South Slavs, however, did not form enclosed strongholds. They lived in open rural settlements adopted from the social models of the indigenous populations that they encountered. Settlements were not uniformly distributed. They are found in clusters separated by areas of lower settlement density. The clusters resulted from the expansion of single settlements and they were settlement cells. These were linked by familial or clan relationships. Settlement cells were the basis of the simplest form of territorial organisation known as a Zupa in South Slavic and a Pole in modern Polish. According to the primary chronicle, the men of the Polani lived with his own clan in his own place. Several Zupas encompassing individual clan territories formed the known tribes. To quote, the complex process initiated by the Slav expansion, subsequent demographic and ethnic consolidation culminated in the formation of tribal groups, which later coalesced to create states which formed the framework of the ethnic makeup of modern Eastern Europe. The roots of many tribal names denote the territory for which they inhabited, such as the Moravians along the Morava, the Diocletians near the former city of Doklia, and Severiani, which means northerners. Other names have more general meanings, such as the Polans, Pola means field, Travlians, Drevo meaning tree, whilst others appear to even have non-Slavic, possibly even Iranian roots, such as the Antis, Serbs and Croats. Some geographically distant tribes appear to share names, the Dragovici appear north of the Pripyat River and in the Varda Valley, the Croats in Galicia and northern Dalmatia, and the Opterites near Lubeck and then further south in Pannonia. The root Slav was retained in the modern names of the Slovenes, Slovaks and Slavonians. There is little evidence of migratory links between tribes that share the same name. The common names may just reflect the name given to them by historians or as a common tongue as a distinction between Slavs. The first historical Slavid state was found by Samo in the first half of the 7th century a short-lived tribal union that included parts of Central Europe. By the 9th century, the states of Obradites, Great Moravia and Caritania, Pannonia, Croatia, Serbia had emerged. Bulgaria, which is a non-Slavic creation, became Slavicized by the 10th century. In terms of the early barbarian warrior bands, they typically numbered 200 men or less, typically much less. 
They were intended for fast penetration into enemy territory and an equally quick withdrawal. Procopius wrote that the Slavs fight on foot. They advance on the enemy. In their hands, they carry small shields and spears, but they never wear body armour. According to the preforementioned Strategon, the Slavs favoured ambush and guerrilla tactics and often attack the enemy's flank. To quote, they are armed with short spears. Each man carries two, one of them with a large shield. Sources also mention the use of cavalry. Simulcata wrote that the Slavs dismounted from their horses in order to cool themselves during the raid. And Procopius wrote that Slav and Hun horsemen were Byzantine mercenaries. In their dealings with the Sarmatians and Huns, the Slavs themselves may have become skilled horsemen, explaining their expansion. Again, going back to the Strategon, the Slavs were a hospitable people who did not keep prisoners indefinitely. And I quote, but lay down a certain period after which they can decide for themselves if they want to return to the former homelands after paying a ransom or to stay amongst the Slavs as free men and friends. Not much is known of pre-Christian Slavic religion. Uh, again, there's no general consensus. However, the primary chronicle, which if I haven't already mentioned, is a 12th century Rus chronicle that describes the early history of the Kievan Rus. It alludes to it being animistic, i.e. the belief that objects, places and creatures all possess a distinct spiritual essence. One of the possible reasons why there's such little historical record for the early Slav religion is due to how Christianity was initially resisted, and as a result of the implementation being brutal, these teachings of Slavic religion was suppressed. One thing that I did find interesting was the ideas of marriage. The practice of capturing wives existed during Slavic tribal times, although on some occasions in Bohemia and Ukraine, men did not choose the spouse, but the women did. Now, as we bring this episode to an end, I'm happy to report this is probably the last where we'll be looking at scarce and contradictory historical records. For the next episode, we'll actually get into the timeline and be can begin to make a lot more sense of the early part of Russian history. Thanks again for joining me. If you enjoyed the episode, and even if you didn't, I would love to read your feedback. If you can spare the time, I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave me a review on iTunes. Not only does this help the podcast grow, it will also be invaluable to me in helping refine my presenting style. Lastly, if you want to help out with the running costs of the show, for example, helping with our hosting costs and the cost of sourcing books and texts that are needed in providing the source material that makes the show work, you can find us over on Patreon at the Russian History Podcast, where you can become a member and receive bonuses such as the show transcripts and episodes on demand. By that I mean you can receive the episodes as and when they're ready. I tend to record two, if not three episodes in one go, rather than needing to listen to them all on a weekly basis as they're released to the wider public. Also feel free to email me feedback to the Russian History Podcast at gmail.com and if you can spare the time, I'd love it again if you could review leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks again, Tara for now.